facing cooperatives in, in Puerto Rico and beyond, as well as all the major successes that are happening and the work that people are doing, um, particularly in the wake of uh, Hurricane Maria, which was only six years ago, and building a better economy that's more democratically controlled and controlled by people. That's what cooperatives are about. That's why we're here. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, this is uh, our first uh, large uh, in-person conference at ACE in four years, so uh, that's exciting. Uh, this is actually our, let's see if I can count, I think it's our 71st conference of ACE as an organization. And um, so I wanted to thank uh, uh, our, our sponsors. Uh, one of the sponsors of ACE, really from its founding, is uh, Sonex Harvest States Foundation. Um, so many thanks to uh, CHS for their support. Um, in terms of the conference itself, uh, we have a, a number of supporters that made this possible and helped fund scholarships to get so many of you to here um, in Puerto Rico. Um, our lead sponsor is CCO, the Center for Cooperatives in Ontario. Um, and they also provide the management services and staffing for ACE, and you'll hear from Josephine in a little bit. Um, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge the support of uh, NCBA uh, CLUSA, which, you know, I don't, is Tia in the room by any chance? I don't see her. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> She'll come later, so say hi to Tia when you can. But Tia saw the, the ability to get this uh, grant from uh, USDA, so um, I don't know, how many folks in this room are uh, scholarship recipients? Okay, so a lot of you. Um, uh, a lot of you got support from, uh, from uh, the, the grant money that Tia was able to obtain, so uh, many thanks to her. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the support of Logix, which I think uh, provided support for folks coming from uh, Quebec. Um, and uh, other large major supporters have been Seguros Multiples here, the insurance uh, cooperative in Puerto Rico. Um, shared capital uh, cooperative in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, the Cooperative Development Foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, and the Ralph K. Morris Foundation, which I believe is based in the Twin Cities, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, additional uh, funders and supporters of this have been Seed Commons. Some of you may know Seed Commons. Uh, they do a lot of funding of cooperative development across the United States. Uh, they have a very impressive network um, that actually started here at ACE 10 years ago, Brendan Martin came to ACE of the working world, and that was where some of the initial funding relationships were formed that led to Seed Commons a few years down the road. Yeah. Um, we also, uh, I want to acknowledge the support of cooperate, uh, Cooperative Works, uh, Cooperation Works, I can say it right, hopefully. <laughs> um, I don't know if Alex is somewhere around. <laughs> uh, Cooperatives First, uh, they're in uh, Western Canada and they do amazing work in uh, First Nations communities in co-op development. Um, the Minnesota Farmers Union is uh, supporting this. Um, in uh, where I live in Boston, we have uh, LEAF, which is the Local Employment Assistance Fund. They support a lot of worker co-ops in, in New England and uh, Boston area. Uh, and then we have a few uh, credit unions from Puerto Rico uh, Bank Co-op, uh, Cabo Rojo Co-op, and Moravena. So thanks to everyone uh, for your support. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, certainly uh, Josephine Agnanon and the staff of uh, CCO. Um, so they're in the blue shirts. Uh, please give them lots of love. <laughs> And I want one of those ace blue shirts, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. 
and uh, also uh, the support of the planning committee. Uh, Jaime here is in the front. He'll be introducing our keynote speaker in a little bit. Um, and um, also we have uh, the, let's see, uh, Charity Schmidt, uh, let's see, uh, Gary uh, Hampton, somewhere. Uh, Tia's not here, but uh, Bernardo, uh, is Bernardo around? There you are. Um, uh, let's see, uh, who else do we have? Esther West. Um, and uh, a couple people who aren't here, but I want to acknowledge Kathy Statz, who is our president emerita. Um, she actually zoomed in from Poland for some of those calls. <laughs> And uh, also uh, Hélène Turcot from Quebec, who played a really important role. And I'm probably leaving somebody else out, but that's uh, hopefully, if, if, if you did, uh, thank you. And um, with that, I want to pass the baton and ha bring, uh, invite up to the mic uh, Glorimar Santini uh, from the university to say a few words. I'm going to do a little bit of both, English and Spanish, to be eclectic and to give everybody the same treatment. First of all, thank you for being here. We hope you have a wonderful time at our university. We're pleased to receive you all, and we hope that this becomes a wonderful learning experience for all of you. We hope that you enjoy the building, the island, for those of you that have, been, have come from the, for the first time. Do we have first comers? Oh. Okay, so we have a lot of people visiting our beaches, I hope. And it's very hot, so you'll enjoy them. Uh, make sure you have a nice drink and you think of the wonderful time that, you, that you're going to have uh, during your stay and whenever you come back to visit. Um, we are honored, and um, as a collective community that's interested in the progress of our community, uh, cooperativism, cooperativism is uh, important for all of us. So we hope that this becomes a standard that we get to see you, I'm not going to say every year, but frequently, um, because we are, we are tuned to our collective needs. And um, in the future, we hope to become part of your community, not only as a center and as a, ho as a host, but also as a means and a, a venue to pass on the message and educate on the matter. So welcome, and uh, to say something in Spanish, bienvenidos a la casa, IBP University. Estamos muy, muy complacidos de que estén aquí hoy y eh, siendo siempre empáticos con el cooperativismo y entendiendo el valor de ser una comunidad integrada y comprometida y respaldamos el movimiento y la educación sobre el tema. Así es que bienvenidos, que tengan un excelente día y que disfruten de esta experiencia educativa que seguro les va a enriquecer grandemente. So God bless you all and have fun. Muchas gracias. Um, uh, next I want to invite up to the mic uh, Josephine uh, Adam. Um, bienvenidos al Instituto ACE. Uh, welcome to the Institute ACE. Uh, so I'm just doing housekeeping details here. If you need interpretation, um, you can go nec uh, next to the booth uh, here, yes. And you can borrow headsets. You just need a piece of ID and you can keep it for the whole day. Um, and the lunch and the coffee breaks will be served in Salon de Actos, so here. Uh, at the at the back of the of the room, so enjoy your day and the exciting panels that you're going to have. Uh, you have more panels in on the fourth floor, um, room 410 and 401. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, and next up, I want to uh, introduce uh, Jaime Cuevas, uh, and he's going to introduce our keynote speaker. So Jaime. Please come to the mic. Uh, buenos días para todos. Un placer. Welcome to everybody. 
to our enchanted island of Puerto Rico. Now you know why they call it enchanted. You can see the view uh, and the people. Uh, hoy vamos a tener con nosotros eh, a nuestro orador principal del evento, José Julián Ramírez, eh, director ejecutivo de FIDECOP. Eh, vamos a estar compartiendo eh, experiencias de desarrollo. José Julián es un cooperativista de una larga trayectoria en el movimiento cooperativo, preparado en eh, telecursos de la Universidad de Mondragón en España, en cooperativismo, graduado de la Universidad aquí de Puerto Rico. Eh, fue eh, educador en la Liga de Cooperativas, tuvo varias posiciones en la Liga de Cooperativas, de ahí pasó a la Asociación de Ejecutivos de Cooperativas, asociación que integra a todos los presidentes ejecutivos de las cooperativas en Puerto Rico. Hizo una excelente labor, ha sido un precursor fuerte de que las cooperativas entren y se desarrollen los fondos CDFI eh, para atraer más capital al sector cooperativo en Puerto Rico y eh, sobre todo eh, ahora está dirigiendo el Fondo de Inversión y Desarrollo Cooperativo, FIDECOOP, que ha sido uno de los grandes aliados. Me uno a las palabras de Steve, agradecer a todos los auspiciadores cooperativas de seguros múltiples, especialmente los locales, que son los que nos ayudaron acá, eh, seguros múltiples, banco cooperativo, la liga que nos ha dado un apoyo extraordinario, eh, Morobeña Coop, la cooperativa de Cabo Rojo, este tiene los bultitos por ahí que nos hizo llegar Kerwin, y tenemos una miembro de su junta por aquí con nosotros, eh, y reconocemos a todos nuestros líderes del sector cooperativo, don William, Marisa Florán, doña Mili, del Grupo Cooperativo Seguros Múltiples y otros directivos. Así que gracias por estar aquí. Eh, nuestro keynote speaker será José Julián Ramírez, así que va a estar próximamente con nosotros. Así que bienvenidos y gracias por estar aquí. Esperemos que esta, esta mesa grande de educación cooperativa sea de beneficio para todos. José Julián Okay, buenos días. We are very happy to, to have you here. Um, thanks to Steve, thanks to uh, Josephine and everyone here. Um, please grab your headphones because maybe I'll be switching between English and Spanish. 75% English and then Spanish if something, um, if I get lost in translation. so. Um, uh, the, the pr this presentation, um, first of all, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm feeling very humble to be invited for, for this presentation. And um, we are very, very excited to share our cooperative experience. So in 40 minutes, I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to, you know, to share uh, a little bit of history of Puerto Rico, a little bit of history of the cooperative movement and our challenges and, of course, uh, our victories. So, uh, I would like to start um, talking about the first name of Puerto Rico, Boriquen. Boriquen was Puerto Rico's name before Spanish colonization, so welcome to Boriquen. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Um, and uh, a little bit of history on 1493, approximately, um, Christopher Columbus was the, arrives to Puerto Rico. He was the conqueror of the island of San Juan Bautista at that time. And Taino insurgents were killed and the survivors were taken as slaves. So there was a lot of slavery and annihilation for the Taino people in Puerto Rico. In 1513, African slaves were brought to the island, and in 1520s, the island took the name of Puerto Rico while the port became San Juan. Puerto Rico means rich port. Uh, so at that time in 1520s, uh, the, the, the name of the, of the, of the capital uh, switched to the name of the country. Um, for 400 years 
of Spanish colonization, uh, Puerto Rico was a Spaniard settlement, a military uh, settlement uh, for Spaniards. And it was threatened by other European powers like the British, the Dutch, the French, always repelled by the local Spaniards, the Puerto Ricans. And in the 19th century, the political changes in Spain promotes migration and to Puerto Rico from economic repress location in Spain and Europe. This was the beginning of agriculture-based economic growth with sugar, tobacco, and coffee being the main products in the island. In the 19th century also, on 1868, hundreds of men and women in the town of Lares stricken by poverty and politically estranged from uh, Spain, revolted against Spanish rule, seeking Puerto Rican independence, the Grito de Lares, the Lares uprising. And this is important because the main purpose of that uprising was freedom of association, freedom of commerce, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, and the abolition of slavery. Through the revolt was unsuccessful, Following the Grito de Lares, political and social reforms occurred toward the end of the 19th century. Five years later, Grito de Lares uh, was uh, established the first uh, Puerto Rican co-op. Uh, the, the name of this co-op was um, Society for Mutual Help, the Friends of Public Good. Okay? That's the... Um, um, the first page of the bylaws of, of uh, that cooperative. It was a health cooperative and a mutual. Um, and these guys, the first one at the top, Santiago Andrade, he was a carpenter and uh, he was the, the, uh, the leader of this cooperative. Uh, the Society for Mutual Help, the Friends of the Public Good. And, lady, and later, in 1894, uh, was established the first local credit union in Puerto Rico, the Collective Saving, El Ahorro co eh, Colectivo. That was the, the name of that um, credit union. Uh, and it was established by Dr. Jose Celso Barbosa, a surgeon and a politician, a very known politician in Puerto Rico. 1898 was the U.S. invasion. Uh, the U.S. established a military government here in Puerto Rico. And the American program include building up of modern economic infrastructure that include roads, ports, electric power system, and telephones and telegraphs, as well as hospitals and programs to develop agricultural, uh, mostly monocultural uh, plantations. In the 19 hundred was established the Foraker Act. And this was very important because at that time we started having a civil government. Uh, the governor was appointed by the US president. We had at that time, and we still have, uh, a one resident commissioner. We don't have members to the Congress of the United States. Uh, and 35 local legislators. And of course, we have free entry of Puerto Rican goods into the U.S. Uh, market. 1917, sorry, uh, no, 1917 was established the Jones Act, the second most important. Uh, it, it was like a constitution for the, Puerto, the civil Puerto, Ric Puerto Rican government at that time. The act made Puerto Rico as an organized but incorporated, unincorporated U.S. territory. Puerto Ricans were also given a restricted U.S. citizenship. Puerto Ricans residing on the island did not have full American citizenship rights. And months later, 20,000 Puerto Rican soldiers were sent to the United States Army during the First World War. So our... Um, U.S. citizenship is like a second-level citizenship, and, and this is still right now. 
uh, the act also divided the government powers into three branches, executive, le legislative, and judicial branches. And in 1920, start what we call the second wave of the cooperative movement in Puerto Rico. And uh, the photo you are looking at is the photo of the first uh, public housing project in Puerto Rico in 1937. But the reason I put it here is because in 1954, it becomes the first housing co-op in Puerto Rico. So the people uh, living in these public houses transform their uh, model of living into uh, the first housing co-op. El Falansterio, as you, those who, who knows Charles Fourier, El Falansterio was to honor Mr. Charles Fourier. 1920s, Rosendo Matienzo Cintron, who he was a legislator and politician, promotes the first laws for cooperative societies in Puerto Rico. But at that time, just consumer and production co-ops were allowed. This legal fra framework do not establish a clear link to Rochville, Rochdale Pioneer's principles. 1945, start what we call the third uh, wave of cooperative movement in Puerto Rico, inspired by, by the Antigonish movement. We ha do we have people from Canada? Good. So we, we were uh, very inspired by the cooperative movement in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is the front page of a book of lectures from pa uh, Father Joseph MacDonald who was sent by Moses Cody on 1946. So, in 1945, there was a lot of excitement because the post-war era, uh, there was transformation of political regime in Puerto Rico also. During her sabbatical year, Ana Maria O'Neill, who is the, the woman at the left, in, in, in that um, slide, visited cities in Mexico, US, and Canada looking for economic development models. When she arrived at Nova Scotia, she came very excited about the Antigonish movement and the project for adult education and the creation of cooperatives in their communities. O'Neill through thought there was a cultural similarity between Nova Scotia and Puerto Rico. Both were mainly Catholic populations, agricultural, and maritime uh, territories. So she invites Moses Cody to Puerto Rico, but unfortunately he had health issues that prevent him uh, coming to Puerto Rico. Instead, he sends Father Joseph Alexander MacDonald. In 1945, MacDonald starts his lectures on adult education for the masses and the cooperative model to Puerto Rican scholars and government officials. One of those officials were Ramon Colón Torres, who was very close person to Luis Muñoz Marín, president of the Senate of Puerto Rico. Luis Muñoz Marín was later the first democratically elected governor of Puerto Rico. But at that time, Colón Torres convinced Muñoz Marín to create a special commission made up of legislator, scholars, and government officials with the task of acknowledging the Antigonish program, evaluate the challenges of Puerto Rico's cooperative movement, and make some recommendations. So these six people uh, was the Antigonish uh, Commission. Uh, and the Antigonish report disclosed five important subjects as most relevant challenges for cooperative movement in Puerto Rico. The first one, ignorance of the social function of cooperativism in economic evolution. The second one was lack of cooperative education on philosophy, organization, and governance. The third 
lack of an adequate control system in accounting and compliance with the cooperative principles. The fourth, lack of guidance on the kinds of cooperatives. And the fifth, lack of adequate legislation to address these problems. So they made some recommendations, and the recommendations were the first one, to create a Cooperative Societies General Act, to create a Credit Union Special Act, to create a government of office for regulation and supervision of cooperatives, to create a department to promote and develop cooperatives, and to develop courses in the, of, of cooperativism in the University of Puerto Rico and public schools. And finally, a, a create an agency for the extension of credit in cooperatives. So in this table, you can, in this, um, you, you can see the recommendations and the act approved in the 20th century and later in the 21st century. So original and current legislation made of as part of the recommendation of the Antigonish uh, uh, Commission. All recommendations were fully addressed since they come back from Antigonish. I would like to show you this chart. This is a kind of a flow chart of the cooperative movement back in 1962. In the left part of the chart, you're going to see the private cooperative sector uh, with League of Cooperatives in the top, then the federations, agricultural federation, consumer federation, credit union federation, and so on. And at the right part of the chart, you're going to see uh, the governmental sector for cooperative development. Uh, that time was the administration to uh, promote uh, cooperatives, the bank of cooperatives, the inspector for cooperatives, the Cooperativism Institute in the University of Puerto Rico, and uh, the program for uh, um, cooperatives in the Department of Education. And now, right now, I'm going to talk about the current structure of the cooperative movement. In the, the uh, governmental sector, we have the Commission for Cooperative Development. This is the agency in charge of promoting cooperatives and the registration process at the Department of State. And this, the law enabling the Commission for Cooperative Development attach two entities, COSEC, which is the public Corporation for the Supervision of Cooperatives and Credit Union, and also Deposit and Shares Insurance for Credit Unions, and FIDE Co-op, which is a non-for-profit corporation and cooperative development financial institution. FIDE Co-op match funds from cooperatives and uh, government to provide technical assistance and to provide financial assistance to startups. Uh, and, and existing cooperatives in the island. And also we have the Cooperative Institute in the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus. I, I think uh, that we're going to have a tour for uh, Cooperative Institute tomorrow. I think so, yeah, yes. Yes, yes. So, uh, in the private sector, we do have first level co-ops in Puerto Rico, we have almost um, uh, cooperatives in every sector, credit unions, consumer, worker co-ops, producers, retailers, housing, health, youth, energy, so on. In the second level we have, um, we don't, actually we don't have federations, but we have uh, second level co-ops for uh, different uh, business activities. For example, we do have uh, Seguros Multiples, which is uh, the insurance co-op for, for property insurance, and COSBI, which is the uh, life insurance co-op, and Bank Co-op, which is not quite frankly a cooperative, 
is a bank, but uh, the owners of this bank are uh, credit unions and co-ops all across the island, okay? And the third level cooperative, the national, uh, is the League of Cooperatives, which is our national confederation in Puerto Rico. So now I would like to talk about our crisis, multiple crises in the fiscal debt, political dilemma, natural disaster, and climate change, and how this uh, crisis uh, impact our life, our daily life, and of course our, our cooperatives. Uh, in 1952 uh, was established the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. The Constitution of Puerto Rico was approved by the voters in a referendum and the federal law approved it, subject to amendments that were finally ratified in November of, the, of that year. That same year marked the first time that the flag of Puerto Rico could be publicly displayed after having been criminalized in 1948. Puerto Rico is not is non-incorporated territory of the U.S. and our population has limited rights as U.S. citizens. 20th century, the industrialization was in part fueled by general local incentives and freedom from federal taxation while providing access to continental U.S. markets without import duties. As a result, a rural agricultural society was transformed into an industrial working class. Maybe that's why we don't have a lot of agricultural co-ops in the island. We, we, we have more credit unions, and at that time, uh, we had a lot of consumer co-ops. Manufacturing activity, mostly pharmaceutical, however, has been burdened by electricity rates to two to three times the average in the United States. In 1976, uh, to support the Puerto Rican economy and reduce dependence on federal funds, Congress amended the Internal Revenue Co Code and created Section 936. Its purpose was to allow subsidiaries of U.S. corporations to establish operations on the island and repatriate their profits to the parent company without paying federal taxes. And that's very important because in 1993, facing a budget deficit in the U.S., legislation was passed that limited the tax credit corporation could assign to their manufacturing production in Puerto Rico. Section 936 was eliminated in August 1996 with a 10-year grace period for companies that remain in Puerto Rico. And that 10 period finally arrived on um, 2006, so you're going to see later that on 2006 we had a lot of fiscal crisis and in, in, in an economic crisis in Puerto Rico before the 2008 financial global crisis. So why does Puerto Rico have so much debt? Well, the end of the subsidies led to companies fleeing the island, which itself subsequently led to tax shortfalls. At first, the Puerto Rican government tried to make up for the shortfall by selling public properties and later issuing bonds. In fact, that, that's a photograph from protesters in, in 1997, the selling the, of, the public, of a public company, the telephone, the Puerto Rico uh, uh, telephone company. Eventually, there's that burden because became so great that the island was unable to pay interest on the bonds it had issued. The North American Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States was seen as sign that Section 936 was no longer viable because of these free trade agreements with the rest of the Western Hemisphere Puerto Rico's advantage as a territory of the United States was lost in the post-Cold War world. And of course, the loss of military and geopolitical importance of Puerto Rico means Puerto Rico is less important for the U.S. So here you're going to see in this chart 
the most important crisis. On 2006, the first government uh, shut down and the government of Puerto Rico established the first sales tax on 2006. And there was a, an economic recession. On 20, sorry, on 2008, the supreme, subprime mortgage crisis resulted in three commercial local banks closed. And at that time, we only have six commercial local banks. So we practically have the bankruptcy of the 50% of those banks in the island. And in on 2015, there was the Puerto Rican bonds crisis. Uh, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico uh, was in bankruptcy, so the U.S. Congress approved Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, and a Fiscal Oversight Management Board that was the best exhibit of colonialism in Puerto Rico. So those who's, who's going to be um, making tours in, in Old San Juan, maybe you can you will see this, um, sorry, this flag is a, a flag of Puerto Rico, but it's black and white. This is the morning flag of Puerto Rico, and it's an anti-colonialism symbol, meaning resistance and resilience. It, w it was created for the for first time in 2016, after, after PROMESA, by um, artists who create this flag. 2016 was the major reputational crisis for local credit unions. Um, why? Because local credit unions bought one billion in government bonds. Uh, so from 2010 to 2016, local credit unions bought almost one billion in Puerto Rico government bonds. And there was a lot of fear among financial consumers spread by the media and the press. And of course, that means a running, a running from, from credit unions. As you can see in this chart, um, we lose in one year 164 millions in withdrawals from uh, credit unions. It was, it was a, a, a big crisis. And in 2017, we welcome the worst hurricane in 100 years. Uh, first came Hurricane Irma on September 6, and 10 days later, Maria wiped off the island. It was a uh, hurricane, a category five hurricane, uh, 40 inches in precipitation, almost 3,000 deaths. Some, some people said it, it was more, but at least uh, the University of the G, uh, uh, the, the University, George Washington University says almost 3,000. Well, there was total collapse in Puerto Rico. No electrical power for more than one month in all the island total collapse on telecommunications, and just 25% of the communities have uh, tap water. Today, we still have communities that are not, uh, th that don't have electric power, okay? Okay, um, so you can imagine no electric, uh, the electrical outage, means no telecommunications plus no portable water. It means health crisis, leptospirosis, uh, asthma, not enough gas and diesel, no merchandise on supermarkets, no banks on duty on rural areas, not enough cash, no place for small businesses in rural areas to keep their cash. For one month, 17 municipalities had no banks operations. 
So imagine you, you can use your credit card, you can't use your debit card, you need cash, but your bank is closed. So it, is, it, it was a, a, a very big crisis because Puerto Rico, we have a lot of mountain in the center of the island and, and, and there was a lot of breaches that collapsed. So you can't move to another town. You, you need to stay on your town and you have no cash. You have money in the bank, but the bank is closed for more than one month. So credit unions uh, were very important at that time. Uh, what they do? Well, credit unions open their vaults for members and non-members. Small businesses and people were very grateful of their local credit unions. Why? Because um, credit unions, for example, a, a, a drugstore or, or um, a supermarket, uh, they are selling only in cash. The gas station sells only in cash, but they, they don't have where to put that amount of cash. So credit unions start opening their vaults, opening memberships for those uh, business uh, persons so they can put the money on the credit unions and the credit unions start changing the, the payroll checks to the people who works on those businesses and who works in the government. So th that, that was very, very, very important. And this improves our reputation, the reputation of credit unions in the island. Uh, our reliability, the respect from the people, and of course the good reputation from the people was better than in the banks in the 2018. As you may know, uh, there was a lot of economic crisis, so the average net migration over the past three years before Maria has been around 60,000 people per year. Only in 2018, we lose more than 140,000 people who migrated to the U.S. And in 2019, there was the earthquakes. Mostly at the southwest of the main island. And, uh, of course, Co-ops and credit unions all over the territory in the U.S. contributed more than $500,000 uh, for uh, employees and community leaders who were victims from the most affected areas. And there comes the political crisis on 2019, another crisis. <laughs> um, that was the biggest political crisis in 50 years. It was the first time a governor of, the Puerto, R of Puerto Rico resigned office. Sorry, here. Um, why? Because the management after Irma and Maria, corruption and a lack of empathy with population. So more than one million people in the streets outraged by government corruption. And in 2020, we received COVID-19. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, the pandemic, oh, let me, let me tell you that um, in Maria, not only the credit unions have a very important role in, you know, on, 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 on to improve, you know, the, the, the good reputation of cooperatives, but also, for example, the transport cooperatives, because trans transport cooperatives uh, move the diesel and the fuel are across the island. Okay. So the pandemic forced co-ops and credit unions to take a faster technological leap. It was a game changer for labor management, of course, and Suing co-ops were important for local manufacture of face masks and medical gowns. Fide Co-op was key in reaching agreements uh, between suing co-ops and medical suppliers so they can manufacture local face masks 
and medical gowns for a health professional. So what we do uh, with the main challenges and what was uh, our co-op response? Well, in economic and our economic and financial response, in order to expand local credit union services to the remaining population, there was a massive CDFI certification for more than 80 local chartered credit unions in the island. In six years, this action produced more than 300 millions in grants, technical assistance, financial assistance from the CDFI fund. Thanks to the alliance between the Puerto Rico Cooperative Movement and Inclusive Credit Union Network, uh, we, we were, were able to do um, capacity building on employees in, in credit unions so they can apply for these grants. Cooperatives and small businesses benefited from SBA Paycheck Protection Program due to the support of FIDE Co-op and 7A lenders credit unions. Energy response, well, uh, we increased in, uh, we, we, we had, have an increase in solar loans from local credit unions. Unfortunately, we don't have statistics before 2021, but in 2021, our solar loan portfolio was 28.37 millions in uh, solar loans. One year later, on 2022, we, we get 49, point, 49 millions in, in our solar portfolio. So it, it was a very large uh, increase. Uh, Fide Co-op, uh, uh, in, in, in 2020, after 2021, we also uh, start establishing energy co-ops and electrical co-ops in the island. The first one was Pirucho Co-op. I'm afraid we're gonna, I, I think you, you, you're gonna visit Pirucho Co-op, it was the first one. Uh, Cooperativa Hidroelectrica de la Montaña, Rem Co-op, and Abeino Co-op. And uh, Fide Co-op had a, a relevant role guiding Pirucho Co-op as the first uh, electrical co-op in Puerto Rico. Uh, also, commercial co-op, uh, we, we uh, established a commercial co-op in Puerto Rico, integrated by 11 certified electricians, owners of small electrical companies. Uh, their name is Electric Co-op. Um, they, they reach an agreement with Luma Energy, which is the company in charge of electric distribution and transmission in Puerto Rico. Electric Co-op had a very important role reconnecting electrical power after last year, Hurricane uh, Fiona. Yes, we had a hurricane last year, too. And Fide Co-op uh, extend a line of credit of 1.6 million to Electric Co-op so they can do that kind of, of job. Part of our energy co-op response, uh, this is for here uh, now in, in August, uh, Emprende Co-op, which is the business accelerator of uh, Fide Co-op, reached an alliance with Inter, uh, Interstate Renewable Energy Council. So we're gonna have a new cohort for um, housing co-ops now starting this month. And we will, we will be uh, building uh, capacity and technical assistance in solar energy, energy storage, community solar, and microgrids for those uh, housing co-ops. These housing co-ops are mostly populated by low and moderate income people, and also a lot of seniors live in, this, in these uh, buildings. We also have a very important demographic challenge, uh, our silver tsunami, like everywhere else, uh, and we, we are very aware of the rapid increase of the elderly in our, demogra in our demography. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we sell more diapers for adults than for babies, okay? 
Well, migration on youth and professional uh, from 3.7 on 2010 to 3.2 millions to 2020. However, members of credit unions increase. In 2017, before Hurricane Maria, 988,000 members, and right now we have 1.3 members in our credit unions, okay? So one-third of our population is related to a credit union. And another statistic, very important. In the US, there are one caregiver per 10 people who need home care services. But in Puerto Rico, for every caregiver, we have 108 people who need that kind of services. So we have a very, a, a big challenge there. And what was our response? For example, in FIDE Co-op, uh, our response has been to focus on small businesses' conversions to worker co-ops. And mostly those, those small businesses who, who their owners are um, baby boomers. They want to get retired and, and they can sell their, their businesses to to the employees and, and the workers, and also to promote caregiver co-ops. And we have an example, um, 2021, we extend a commercial loan and business mentoring to ADA security integrators. Uh, we extend a 250,000 loan for them so they can be capable of acquiring and, and being owners of, of the business where they work for 35 years. And to promote caregivers co op like Pasos Dorado, uh, in FIDECO we have a 0% rate micro loans for startups, and Pasos Dorado uh, received last year this uh, micro loan from, from us. It's a 0% micro loan for startups here. Well, yes, uh, meeting the challenge of resilience. Um, after 150 years of Puerto Rican cooperativism, we attest to having faced challenges that force us to bring out the best of our character. However, these challenges do not compare with those faced by our pioneers for more than a century and a half ago. Cooperatives have a strange way of becoming stronger when we face challenges. Our institutions are resilient for definition. We have the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and spring back into our original shape. That is a fact. But when you got to be resilient all the time and you have to overcome fiscal bankruptcy and overcome the economic crisis, financial stress, natural disaster, climate change, energy outage, and political corruption, resiliency sounds like resignation. If resiliency means returning to the original state of matter we were before, then we should not want to be resilient. Cooperatives were not created to turn back to our original point of departure, but to go forward and take a leap into something new. Cooperatives were created for social evolution, for social re-evolution, so let's face our challenges and become a chrysalis, because we will not be a caterpillar again. Let's open our butterfly wings so we can fly the air of a more democratic economy and equitable new society. Thank you. So uh, Jose Julian will stay here. I'm just okay. gonna be uh, moderating questions, so um, we do have time for questions. I encourage questions. Uh, you know, 
I forgot to mention my opening remarks, but luckily Jose Julian reminded me that this is the 150th anniversary of the uh, cooperative movement in Puerto Rico, so I think that deserves a round of applause too. And um, I'll start with one question and I'll, you know, uh, well, go ahead. We'll just go to you. Oh, youth co-ops. Yeah, um, almost every youth co-op in, in the island is in a scholar co-op. Uh, uh, sorry, not scholar, a school co-op. So um, a lot of, of, of these co-ops uh, were closed because of, of COVID-19. But they are starting uh, a, new, a new wave of youth cooperatives. For example, um, in June, we prepare with the Commission for Cooperative Development. We, I mean, the program Emprende Coop from Fide Coop. We prepare a boot camp for 10 uh, youth cooperatives across the island, so they can get uh, capacity building uh, and 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 help them to to start again. Their, their cooperatives, mostly consumer co-ops. Uh, statistics says we have 120 youth cooperatives in the island. I'm not very sure of that number, but you know, and, and uh, especially after COVID-19, but that's what they say. Um, so I'll ask a question and then uh, and then I'll go to more to the audience. Um, so one question, and feel free, Jose, to responder en español si prefieres. Um, but uh, my question is about the prepa and the privatization and how that's affect and how the cooperative movement is positioning itself regarding that and you know sort of what is the status of trying to build the renewable energy decentralized system that folks like REM Co-op are trying to do? Yeah. Eh, sí, esto lo voy a contestar en español. Como mencioné eh, más temprano, eh, las cooperativas de ahorro y crédito han aumentado su eh, eh, la extensión de eh, préstamos eh, solares. Eh, y hemos promovido la creación de cooperativas de energía en las comunidades. En estos momentos hay el the DOE, el Department of, of Energy, eh, ha dedicado un billón de dólares para el desarrollo de eh, energía renovable en comunidades de bajos ingresos. Así que... Eh, En Fideco eh, estamos liderando junto a otras organizaciones como el Interstate Renewable Energy Council, Remco Op, and, and the Association for Cooperative Executives. Eh, estamos promoviendo el desarrollo de una posible central de energía que nos permita eh, descentralizar comunidades eh, de Con, con energía renovable y creando cooperativas comunitarias. Pero eso es un proyecto que está incipiente, está comenzando. Yes, I want to thank you for answering that question. My question is related to development and Uh, my question is related to development and connecting community to infrastructure that makes the uh, island a little bit more sustainable when faced with other challenges. Are there cooperative efforts around redevelopment? You mean um, like uh, for the cons Housing construction? Yes, we, uh, in fact, we have a, a, a client of Fide Coop, which is uh, 
a, a cooperative of engineers. They are contractors. But I think there's little, hay uh, poco avance en, en ese, there's little um, progress in, in, in that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a two-part question, Sharon, from the 2020 Farmers Co-op. I'm gonna stay on the energy. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna stay on the energy just for a second, because um, I'm curious about that. Do you know if, in fact, there are any legal ramifications or legal obstacles, Department of Energy, that will preclude your uh, energy co-ops here in Puerto Rico from lending to uh, stateside rural agricultural areas or anything in that energy space just for that collaboration Puerto Rico US stateside uh, no and uh, for example I know that in Dominican Republic they have a lot of obstacles to 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 build for, for example to generate energy if you create a, a, a worker cooperative or a community cooperative to uh, electrical co-op uh, they have, you know, uh, obstacles, legal obstacles to, to, to create, to generate energy, but not in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, for fortune, fortunate, um, we have a very good legal framework. And uh, that legal framework in, in, in part was, was possible because of, of Jaime Cuevas here. Mm -hmm. He had, had like, Four or six years ago, I think it was six or eight years ago, he, he were crucial on helping senators in, in the Senate of Puerto Rico to build um, an amendment to the uh, uh, General Cooperative Society Act so they can include electrical cooperatives in the island. Okay. So just in clarity, in my clarity, so there are no legal obstacles that you're aware of that no. will preclude um, an energy co-op here in Puerto Rico from lending to an entity stateside? Mm, lending? Yeah, L let's say for example, you had a business here in Puerto Rico. Huh? They went to the energy co-op to say, okay, we want to get one of your $250,000 micro loans to build the infrastructure for some solar energy. Does that come outside of mm. Puerto Rico? Who? Who the? Yeah, uh, but as I, do, I don't know, but here electrical co-ops don't give loans. They, they You mentioned about one of the energy, the resolutions uh -huh. to that was the small micro loans. One was at 250, the other one. Oh, oh that, that was the credit unions. Right, right. Uh, credit right. unions increased their uh, uh, solar loan portfolios. Okay, so. But, but, but uh, local charter credit unions in Puerto Rico, they can't make loans for communities out of the territory. Okay, that's, okay. that's what I needed to know. Okay, now second question, moving on. Um, I think you mentioned there's no, no doubt that the uh, free trade amendment back in 1996 had an impact on Puerto Rico and maybe the agricultural uh, co-ops kind of decreased mm -hmm. from that perspective. What's your thought or any of the organizations in ramping up the agricultural co-ops because of, and I'm gonna say the mind shift that should be occurring as it relates to agriculture. What's, what's the movement with the agricultural co-ops here? Yes, um, in terms of FIDE co-op, uh, that's one of our four pillars. Uh, so for us, it's very important to build um, agricultural uh, security, food security in the island. And we, we were awarded uh, last year, no, no uh, sorry, this year, we were awarded with 
a, a grant from USD Rural Development, eight, eight million grant for mid, uh, the Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program to help those uh, agricultural co-ops to have their slaughterhouse and, and have uh, meat plants and so on. So for us, it's very, very important to help those farmers to, to have their, their, their co-ops Yes. Okay. Sí, um, no escuché mucho en la presentación sobre cooperativas de trabajo. Uh -huh. ¿Hay alguna industria en específico que está más, eh, o qué números hay en relación a ese tipo de cooperativas? La mayoría de las cooperativas de trabajo en Puerto Rico eh, están en el sector de servicio, uh -huh. pero tenemos cooperativas industriales, eh, sí, tenemos cooperativas industriales, también manufactura. Eh, we do have two sewing co-ops. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. We have uh, one industrial co-op in Fajardo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. ¿Y hay legislación um, que apoya el, ese modelo de, de cooperativa? Afortunadamente, la, la ley general de cooperativas permite, eh, la que se aprobó en el 2002, eh, tiene un capítulo específico expresamente para cooperativas de trabajo. Sí. Gracias. Tengo una pregunta adicional. En términos del ecosistema de las cooperativas en Puerto Rico, ¿de qué tamaño de empresas estamos hablando? ¿Cuántos en, en promedio? Porque hay unas que se mencionan bastante grandes, como de energía, pero si estamos hablando de la cantidad de, de cooperativas en Puerto Rico, ¿cómo ¿cuántas caerían en pequeñas empresas? Mm. Y de esas, de dentro de ellas, estamos sí. hablando de dos o tres trabajadores, de 10, uh -huh. de, de, de cómo se ve el ecosistema en ese aspecto. Uh, la inmensa mayoría son eh, pequeñas empresas, la inmensa mayoría son pequeñas empresas. Eh, nuestras cooperativas más grandes son eh, seguros múltiples, eh, COSBI, el banco cooperativo. Uh, en total, si sumas los activos de todo el sistema, está cerca de los 14, 14 mil millones. O sea, uh, assets for the cooperative businesses in, in Puerto Rico are roughly 14 billion dollars uh, here in Puerto Rico. And, pero muchas de las cooperativas a las que servimos son pequeñas, eh, tienen pocos miembros. For example, uh, the, the, those worker co-ops uh, in manufacture, they have roughly 20 members, everyone, uh, everyone. or less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Can you, okay. Um, I, I didn't um, hear much about wealth building. Um, wealth building. So how, how can you describe the wealth building model in terms of underserved communities here in Puerto Rico to that of cooperatives? The, the Sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the word wealth. Wealth, 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 wealth oh, building. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wealth. I didn't hear much uh, 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 reference to wealth building in underserved communities. Um, I didn't have that statistics right now, but just to give you an example, uh, a few years ago I remember to, we, we, we tried to understand if credit unions were wide off the island how much it's, it's going to cost to the population. And our calculation was like 20 million annually. Why? Because credit unions, for example, they have low, the lowest rates on loans and the highest rates on deposits. So if you make a calculation uh, between banks, for example, and the rates of credit unions, you're gonna see that's a lot of money 
in, in, in the pockets of, of the common people. And, of course, these credit unions are localized in the poorest areas of, of Puerto Rico. Yes. And, and secondly, um, how are you uh, uh, getting out th this cultural uh, history about co-ops into the, the, the into the learning pathways of 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 those who may not uh, be aware of 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 the cultural history of co-ops here in in the island. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Uh, education is like boiling water; you have to keep it in in <laughs> in the stove every time, uh, and and that's why we are here, <laughs> and that's why ACE is very important, and. You have to keep, you know, uh, having these chats with uh, executive presidents and telling the importance of the education for, you know, keeping, knowing our own history, knowing, uh, you know, the, 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 if you don't know your history, you, you're going to, you know, vas a volver a cometer los mismos errores, así que. Yes, in, in the past, probably up to 19, you know, the beginning of the, of the new century, Puerto Rico was very active, uh, being a model of cooperativism in other countries, particularly Dominican Republic and Central America, mm -hmm. uh, a big involvement, not just in, the, in terms of education, studying, mm -hmm. uh, bachelor degree and, mm -hmm. uh, and other type of education, but also in fostering and studying different type of co-ops like uh, insurance co-ops mm -hmm. uh, directly with the Puerto Rico money, basically in those countries, mm -hmm. studying those co-ops. But in the last 20 years, I would say that have kind of yes. uh, shrink. With the uh, crisis. Okay. Yes. Yes, but we still we still have very close relationship with insurance co-op in Colombia and in the Dominican Republic. Um, but of course, I, I remember a story that there was uh, a, a you know like a, a tour from um, uh, cooperative leaders from Puerto Rico to Costa Rica, and they start you know, complain about the cooperatives in Puerto Rico because, you know, the, the Costa Rican uh, cooperatives are, you know, uh, they are bigger and they have a lot of agricultural co-ops there. And, and when they ask, you know, uh, people from Puerto Rico ask to the uh, people in, in Costa Rica how they build their, their uh, co-ops, so good co-ops, they said, well, you show us, you know, you, 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 yeah, you, you, we, we, you teach us because we went to the cooperative institute and they, they tell us how, how to do it. <laughs> so sometimes we have to go back and, and, and remember how we did it. Are there any more questions you want to say? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Excuse me. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, so I had a question around the home care space. I work in the home care space in the States uh, with ICA Group. I'm based out of New York. They're based out of Massachusetts. We've done work with Fideo Coop. And I was wondering about... Um, you know, I, I saw that you're doing conversions work and also uh, supporting the development of home care cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does like the policy and kind of governmental change connected mm -hmm. to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, is there any plan around that because it's so connected right to the home care industry, mm -hmm. like Medicaid not being something that is reimbursed here? And so, is there That's any right. work around that or mm -hmm. connecting? to other organizations. I'm curious about that because I feel like it's an important piece mm -hmm. of home care. So, great, yes, because as you, as you mentioned, uh, here in, in, in Puerto Rico is an un, unincorporated 
territory of the U.S. So we we can't access Medicare, uh, full Medicare and full uh, Medicaid uh, services for the elderly, for example. And that's that's a, a big challenge. So what what we are doing is we we establish a task force for um, promoting. Um, um, caregiver co-ops, and we try to to establish some kind of alliance with the government because I'm, I'm going to say this in Spanish because it's, it's easier for me. En Puerto Rico, la mayoría de las caregivers eh, no están trabajando en la economía formal. Así que tienen beneficios del welfare a la vez que trabajan por debajo de la mesa. Así que lograr que se unan en una cooperativa es muy difícil si el gobierno no eh, acepta extenderle los beneficios de SNAP or, o, o, o de welfare y permitirles que continúen trabajando. That's the challenge. Bueno, ¿qué, ¿qué estamos haciendo el tiempo? Estamos bastante cerca, pero quiero dar una pregunta que es, si hay un ejemplo inspirador de una co cooperativa nueva que se haya desarrollado después de todas las crisis que están describiendo que quieren compartir. Yo creo que si menciono una, <laughs> las demás podrían quejarse. Yo creo que <laughs> sí. Um, um, sí. I think that there is a new beginning here in Puerto Rico in terms of accelerators and some type of uh, managerial help, I would say, yeah. basically from the university and from Fide Cops uh -huh. to incubate mm -hmm. uh, new cooperatives. And I think mm -hmm. that that is going to be the, the model mm -hmm. that it will take place, yeah. basically. So, so I'm give you an ex I will give you an example. For me, um, for example, um, ARA security integrators, the people who work in, in this company for 35 years, uh, it was awesome. It, it was a, a very nice experience to, to work with them because they asked for a loan. But they also uh, put a lot of money. They, ellos eh, sacaron el dinero de su retiro para comprar la empresa. They take, they take their, 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 you know, yeah, the, um, see the, the retire, the retirement plan, and they put it on, on the company so they can buy it. And, you know, eso nos recuerda que el cooperativismo no se trata de donativos, de filantropía. El cooperativismo es eh, ayuda mutua y esfuerzo propio. We have a coffee break, I think, for the next half hour. So if you have other questions for Jose Julian, you know, find him. Uh, he's around. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. <laughs> Gracias.